My name is Howard Hennett. Thank you all for coming. Today we're going to be talking about everything time and especially time zones. I've got kind of a lot of information to present here, so I know you're going to have questions, and I'm, I usually like to take them during the talk, but I'm going to ask you to hold your questions to the end of the talk, and then hopefully we'll have enough time to answer all the questions after the talk. But in case we don't, I'll also be here all week. Catch me in the hall. Ask me anything you want. I love to talk about this stuff. So uh, to get started, uh, where this library fits. Last year I had a slide that looked a lot like this, and this is showing sort of the stack of everything that we're talking about today. Down near the, the lower level, we've got our standard Chrono library. It comes from uh, the standard library starting with C++11. And that's what I talked about yesterday. I gave a tutorial on Chrono, and last year I talked about a library called date.h that sits directly on top of Chrono. And that talks, uh, talked about what I'm going to refer to today as calendar types. And then today I'm going to concentrate on a library that sits yet on top of that, uh, lives in a header named uh, tz.h, and it's a time zone library and it talks to this uh, time zone database that lives out on the web, sponsored by IANA, and uh, this is basically a parser for that, for that database. So first a little bit about the uh, philosophy of this library. This library accurately parses all of the information in the IANA time zone database and presents it to the client with no errors whatsoever. And when I say all of the data in this database, I mean all of it, no excuses. No other C++ library actually presents all of the data, so I'll point out in a few places where that's true. And it lives at this uh, URL right here, and this is what this uh, URL looks like. It actually publishes two files. This library deals only with the top one. That's where the database is. The second file is, uh, is a parser for this database, but this library is also a parser, so that second file isn't needed. Uh, so before we get started, I want to talk a little bit about what type safety means, because type safety is very important to this library, to the Chrono library, and, and to me personally. So let's just imagine that we've got some function, and it takes a year, month, day, hour, minute, second, all in ints maybe does some computations with it, and uh, returns it to uh, some, some struct that presumably has a, a constructor that takes all these ints. Now this will compile, but that's a little bit problematic because I've made a mistake here. I've accidentally mixed up my minutes and hours. But this still compiles and it creates a runtime error. But if we design the library like this, where each of these parameters, year, month, day, hours, minutes, seconds, are all different types, and assuming we have a constructor that takes those, those types. Now, this shouldn't compile. Instead, you'll get compile time errors that look like this, that presumably because minutes isn't convertible to months or, or vice versa. So, type safety means that if you accidentally mix up your concepts or your units, the compiler catches the mistake for you before it becomes a runtime error. Compile time errors are good, runtime errors are bad. So this library stresses type safety. This library also does not replace the Chrono library at all. This is an extension of the Chrono library. Uh, it builds upon it, and thus it operates with the Chrono library seamlessly. Uh, if perhaps you didn't attend my talk yesterday and you're not very familiar with the Chrono library, if you have trouble telling where Chrono stops and this library begins, that's by design, that's on purpose. So there's uh, five primary concepts that I'm going to talk about today, and I first just want to list them real quick. First, we have calendar types, and these are field types like year, month, day uh, that are not associated with any time zone at all. The next concept is SysTime. SysTime is a family of chrono time points. All of these time points are based on system clock, but they're parameterized on the duration. So you could have a sys time of nanoseconds or a sys time of microseconds, a sys time of seconds, et cetera, et cetera. And these are all a, a very close approximation to, to UTC. The third concept is also a chrono time point, but it's called local time. It's very similar to sys time, but it's different in important ways, and I'll give you some examples later on, the, on in the talk. The fourth concept is a time zone. Time zone is a geographical area that represents all of the, the rules for changing the UTC offset for that time zone, not only currently, but going back decades, if not 150 years. 
It's all whatever that time zone database at IANA supplies. And they supply quite a bit. And this supplies every single bit of that history. None of it is, is abbreviated. And finally, there's uh, something called a zone time, which is really just a pairing of a local time and a time zone. And that basically just helps everything wrap together with very nice syntax. So let's talk about calendars in a little bit more depth. If you saw my talk last year, uh, this is what the whole talk was about. Now today, I'm just going to very briefly touch on it. So if you don't understand everything I say about calendars, understand that that's an entire another hour long talk. So there's a type called year, month, day that is literally just a struct with three numbers in it that represent the year, month, and the day. Uh, there's a, also another calendar called year, month, weekday, and this is how you might specify something like the third Tuesday of September of 2016. It's got a year, month, a day of the week, and an index. Uh, there's another calendar that represents the week-based ISO, the ISO week-based year. Uh, for example, today in this calendar is Tuesday of the 38th week of 2816. So this contains a, a year, an index, and a day of the week. There's a Julian calendar. There's an Islamic calendar. Ultimately, all of these different calendars are just different ways for giving human readable names to days. And they're all what I call field types, meaning they've got, they're literally, you know, three integers or four integers or whatever it takes to represent the day. So assist time, this is a chrono time point, and this line here is literally the entire definition of it, minus whatever uh, namespaces you might need. This is the uh, standard chrono system time uh, system clock. Namespace is abbreviated just for the purposes of fitting everything on the slide, and it's parameterized on the duration, and on my point, uh, on my platform, if D is microseconds, this is the exact same type as system clock time point. On Linux, uh, if you parameterize it on nanoseconds, that's the exact same type of system clock nine, uh, time point. So this has uh, some convenience type defs, uh, just because they're so often used. There's one for seconds called sysseconds, sys and one for days called sysdays. And days is just another custom chrono duration. It's 24 hours, or 86,400 seconds, or whatever you want to think of it. It's a day, it's a duration that ticks once per day. And that comes in very handy when dealing with calendars. As every single one of the calendar types that we already talked about must convert to and from sys days. You can think of sys days as the canonical name for every single day that's ever existed. Now we also have a type called local time. It's very, uh, uh, very similar to sys time except that it does not uh, associate itself with any particular uh, time zone. And unlike SysTime, it doesn't really have a clock associated with it. There is this thing called local T. You could think of that more like a tag type instead of a full clock type. It has no member function now. You can't get now from a, for a local time because there is no time zone to nail down exactly when now is. Now that turns out not to be a, a big problem, and I'm going to have lots of examples on why that is. Like SysTime, it's, it has some, what is going on there? Does anybody have I, any idea on what button I should hit to fix that? We also have convenience type desks for this, local seconds and local days, just like SysTime. And again, these are uh, just type desk for when we want to say set a local time of seconds or local time of days. Also, all of the calendar types will explicitly convert to and from local days. Now, at first, this sounds like it's going to be a lot of work for your calendar authors, but the exact same math is used for the conversion uh, to and from sys days as local days. Exact same math, same numbers, just different meanings in how we're going to use them. So it's actually very easy for a calendar author to conform to this library. You just write the conversion once and then can you know, switch off on local days or sys days. Next, we have our time zone. As I said, this is the full history of uh, time zone changes throughout any time zone's history. Uh, they vary about how far back they go, but time zone history is dating back to 1850 or not unusual. Uh, it's a very impressive database. 
Uh, you can find any time zone you want with this function called locate zone. You give it the name of the time zone and you get back a pointer to a const time zone. So this is a very lightweight object to, to pass around. But there's no uh, ownership associated with it. It's just a, a non-owning pointer. If you don't want to name your time zone, there's another function called current zone. And whatever uh, time zone your computer is currently set to, that's what you get back. And these two TZs are the exact same type. So uh, in a lot of places, you can either specify a, a name and get a time zone or specify current zone and get a time zone. And I'll show some uh, much more examples, of many more examples like that. And finally, our, uh, our zone time is a pairing between um, a pairing of local time and time zone. Uh, it's also templated on the duration, but there's a restriction because your UTC offsets can, all, can actually be as fine as a second. They're not always integral number of hours. Sometimes they're 15 minutes, sometimes they're seconds. So a zone time must always have a uh, duration as fine as seconds uh, or finer. There's also a factory function for zone time called make zoned, which just takes a string and in this, uh, this example, a, a local time. And even though the local time isn't as fine as seconds, the, the make zone factory function will pare this down and deduce the, that the correct zone time duration to use here is seconds. Uh, and zone time also has a streaming function so that when you print this out, it just prints out the local time in this format. Now this is actually a fairly boring example because as you can see there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between our inputs and our outputs about the most exciting thing that's happening here is we're translating the uh, string America Los Angeles to the string PDT. Uh, trust me it'll get a, hopefully get a little bit more exciting for you. Uh, the library does more than just uh, nothing. Uh, you can also create a zoned time from a sys time. Now a sys time if you recall represents time in UTC. So here, simply by taking this same calendar and instead of converting it to local days, I convert it to sys days instead, and then I can add whatever hours, minutes, and seconds I want. I can create the same zone time type, and I've chosen my hours very carefully here so that I'm even creating the same zone time value. So both of these zone times are the exact same type, exact same value, and there's even an equal-equal operator on them. You could compare them and they would be equal. Uh, Marshall, if you could hold your question, if you possibly resist to the end of the talk so that I, I don't run out of time. But try not to forget it because I do want to answer it. Uh, so both of these output the exact same time because they're, they're the exact same type with the exact same value. It turns out that sometimes it's very convenient to specify your zone time in terms of the local time. But other times, it's actually very convenient to specify your, your time in terms of assist time. And I'll show you some examples of that in a few more slides. Now note that because all calendars must convert to either local days or sys days, all of the calendars that I've mentioned before just seamlessly fold into here. I can use the third Tuesday of September as my calendar date or the uh, 38th Tuesday of 2016. It, it doesn't matter. All of these calendars just seamlessly can be used to construct a zone time because they all convert to local days or sys days. So alternative calendar uh, compatibility is pretty much built into this system. Uh, this will work with any calendars that are written in the future as long as those calendars convert to sys days and local days. Uh, if we want to work with precisions finer than seconds, those also very seamlessly fold in. Once we're converted to local days, we have a chrono time point, whether it's a local time or a sys time. And you can add any duration you want of any precision you want to, to a chrono time point. So in these example, I'm, I'm adding uh, two more milliseconds to my uh, sys time and local time. And the default streaming operator for your uh, zone time prints out the full precision of whatever zone time uh, whatever you've constructed it with. So in this case, milliseconds, and so the .002 just gets printed out. So you can also construct one zone time from another. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I got a slide ahead of myself. Uh, this is a, a really nice example of when it's very convenient to construct your zone time with a sys time. 
Now, if you recall, a sysTime is nothing more than a system clock time point of some duration. So system clock colon colon now returns a system clock time point. On my platform, that returns a time point with a precision of microseconds. On yours, it might be nanoseconds or whatever. Whatever it is, MakeZoned is going to deduce that precision, create a zone time of microseconds in this case. And when you print it out, you get the, the full time to microseconds precision plus the uh, time zone uh, abbreviation, which ought to be fairly close to now if I'm running on time. Uh, if you didn't want to uh, name the time zone, you can just say, give me the current time zone. And you get the exact same type. And assuming that we ran these at the exact same moment, you'd get the exact same value. So these would both print out the exact same thing. Just different ways of doing the same thing. And uh, as I said, this is a good example of when specifying your zone time in terms of a system time turns out to be very convenient. So let's say that we've got a meeting in New York City on the, the first Monday of May 2016 at 9 a.m. We could create a zone time like this, but let's say during this meeting we want a video conference with our partners in London. We need to send them the time of the meeting, and it would be kind of polite to send them their local time, not your local time. So you use this library to do that like this. You can also construct a zone time with a string and another zone time. So I've got one zone time here, and I use that to construct a second zone time here using a different zone uh, time zone. So what happens when you do this is the UTC equivalents of these two times are equivalenced, and this would print out uh, May 2nd, 2016, 1400 hours British summertime, which happens to be the exact same time as the first Monday of May 2016, uh, 9 a.m. in American New York. So moving on to formatting. So far, all I've shown is streaming these things out with what I would call the default formatting. But there is also a format function so that you can format these things any way you want using the strif-like uh, format flags that are specified both in C and POSIX and for the uh, time put function in C++11. Uh, format returns a standard string so that you, you can then just turn around and stream out that standard string and if you're using uh, width or alignment parameters in your stream, that string will get aligned to the left or to the right, whatever you specify by your I.O. manipulators. So in this example, I'm formatting a sys time or a system clock time point uh, using these flags. You don't have to know what they all mean. And it prints out exactly what you'd expect. And this is the exact same thing you'd get as if you'd used uh, time get or um, strift time from the C library. Uh, one of the interesting things to note here is the use of percent capital Z. That's the flag for uh, streaming out the time zone abbreviation of whatever time zone you're, you're referring to. Since I'm using a sys time here, it's implicitly associated with the UTC time zone, if you can think of that as a time zone. And so UTC is used as the translation from the percent Z formatting flag. Now I can also stream out a zoned time. If I take my sys time, use that to create a zoned time with my current zone, I can use the exact same formatting flag, format the zoned time, and get this string. And now my percent %z refers to current zone, assuming that I executed this in our current time zone, America Los Angeles. So I can format sys times and zone times all exactly the same way, using exactly the same syntax. I can even format local times. However, local times are a little bit special. Local times are not associated with any time zone at all. Now recall I said that a zone time was a pairing of a time zone and a local time. So it has getters. You can take the zoned time and get the local time back out of it. And now that local time is not associated with any time zone at all but I've used this, the time zone abbreviation, but there's no time zone, so there can be no time zone abbreviation. So this is a runtime error. I've tried to format a local time with a capital percent Z. It won't let you get away with that silently. 
However, if you just remove the percent %z from this formatting flag, then things just work and you get the local time formatted out just like you like. So in summary, format can be used to format a sys time, a zone time, or a local time. However, the flags percent capital Z and percent uh, lowercase z can't be used with local time. The uh, lowercase z is the one that refers to the UTC offset, which is of course associated with a time zone. So since local times have no associated time zones, those are the only two flags that are off limits in formatting. And they won't be silently ignored. If you try to use them, you'll get an exception. Um, you can also localize uh, all of the formatting just by prefixing everything with whatever locale your, your OS supports. So here I've uh, used a finish locale, and this translates the use of my uh, weekday name and month name to finish. I don't actually know if this is correct or not, but this is the translation my operating system provided, and, and so things just work. Uh, if you want to format to something uh, with a precision finer than seconds, the percent %s flag or the percent %t flag are precision sensitive. Percent %s stands for seconds, percent %t stands for hours, minutes, and seconds, and they key off whatever precision your time point has going in. So assuming this is a, a system clock time point on my system, which has precision microseconds, this prints out the time to six decimal places and because I used uh, percent %t here. Now, if that's not what you want, you simply truncate your time point or, or convert it to whatever precision you want. And here I'm uh, converting it to seconds using floor. You could have used duration cast here just as easily as floor. Floor is something new coming in C++ 17. And now our time has a precision of seconds instead of a precision of microseconds. So you per control your precision through your time point instead of fooling around with the, the formatting flags. If you need wide strings, uh, just supply a wide format string and then format returns a W string instead of a string. And so then you can easily string to stream to your wide streams. So parsing. You can also parse anything that you can format out. You can also parse back in using your parse function. So here I'm going to stream directly into a system clock time point, which is just one of our sys times. Uh, using one of the formatted strings that I streamed out previously and the exact same, I'm sorry, using one of the timestamps and, and the exact same formatting string that I used earlier. And this will stream right in and you can turn around and print it out uh, using the, the default thing and it prints out uh, exactly what we put in. Now notice that uh, here I use percent %z again and percent %z requires a, a time zone abbreviation in whatever spot you've specified. If the time zone abbreviation was missing, you'd get a failure to parse. Uh, however, the time zone abbreviation doesn't actually impact the value of the time points you're putting in. Uh, parse works just like any other formatting, uh, formatted input operator. It sets fail bit if it fails to parse. It sets EOF bit if it reaches the end of file. Uh, it respects the exception flags if you've set those in the stream such that uh, setting EOF bit or fail bit may cause a, uh, an iOS bail base failure exception to be thrown. So there's, there's not much to learn here. It works just like input for string or input for complex numbers or anything else. Now, um, as I said, percent, uh, capital Z requires a time zone abbre abbreviation to be parsed, but it has no value uh, on, the, on the value of the parsed timestamp. But optionally, if you want to discover what time zone abbreviation you parsed, you can add a string to the end of your parse function here, and that will part, whatever time zone abbreviation is parsed will be, then get assigned to that string. And so you can in inspect it, make sure it's okay, and so you can get all of the information out. You can also parse into a, uh, I'm sorry, if you want to handle uh, UTC offsets, you can also do that with the lowercase percent %z. 
Now, when you're using the lowercase percent z, the library assumes that this is now a local time offset by this offset, but we're streaming into a system clock time point, which is implicitly in the UTC time zone. So this timestamp has this offset applied to it. So when you print it back out, you get a time that's in the UTC time zone. Now you can also parse in local time as well as sys time simply by creating a local time and parsing it in. You can parse in the exact same string with the exact same formatting string. But now it still assumes that this is a local time point. It knows you're parsing into a local time, so now it does not apply that UTC offset uh, so that when it prints out, you get the correct local time. 515 uh, default format is in 24 hour format. So the, the percent Z still requires the 0700 to be there and be correctly parsed to have the correct syntax, but then it ignores it in transforming the value of this time point because it's a local time point. And that just trips off the, the type of the time point that you put in, local time versus sys time. Now, if you're curious and, and you're parsing a local time with a percent Z and you want to find out what offset actually got parsed, you can create a chrono minutes, pass that in, and the 0700 will get assigned to the chrono minutes offset, and seven hours is equivalent to 420 minutes, uh, both negative in this case. So you can check and make sure that things are right, even though it's not impact, impacting the value of your time point. Lots of flexibility here, lots of power to do whatever it is you need to do. Um, just like you can use uh, percent %s and percent %t to format out to any precision you want, you can use these same flags to parse in any precision you want. As long as your uh, local time or sys time has precision finer than seconds, and you're using percent %s or percent %t in your, as one of your formatting flags, then uh, fractional seconds will get parsed in correctly. Uh, things just work. So in summary, you can parse sys times or local times. Now, a lot of advice that people give to people when they're dealing with uh, time is never do arithmetic in your local time. Always go, go to the UTC time, do your arithmetic there, and then convert back to your local time. You can do that if you want. This library allows you to do that. You can also do arithmetic in local time using this library, even across daylight savings time boundary, and things will just work. So here I'm setting up a, uh, an experiment to demonstrate what I just said. Uh, I'm gonna create a, a zone time in American New York, I'm going to pick a day, a couple of days, a, a, a date time, a couple of days ahead of this spring's transition from standard time to daylight time, uh, 9 a.m. in the morning, uh, March 11, 2016. Create a zone time out of that. I'm going to put this in a loop, and I'm going to print out both the meeting and the system time that, uh, of, that, of that meeting. Now, I mentioned that uh, zone time was a pairing of a time zone and a local time. You can equivalently think of it as a pairing between a, zone, a time zone and a UTC time. It's, it's all the same thing, really. So you can get the sys time and the local time out of a zone time just with get sys time or get local time. So here I'm, I'm getting the sys time out, printing that out, along with the meeting so that we can see the, uh, the effects of both. The, this will print out the local time. This will print out the UTC time. And then I get the local time out and add one day to it. So now I'm doing arithmetic in local time and then I assign that local time back into the zone time. So this should output an out, a 9 a.m. meeting for all four days across this daylight savings time boundary. When we compile and execute this, this is exactly what gets printed out, uh, except uh, without the red circles. But you see that uh, the meeting correctly prints out at 9 a.m. every day, but as we cross that daylight savings time boundary, it's the UTC time change that changes from 1,400 hours to 1,300 hours. This just works all the time, every time, except if the local time that you compute to happens to be a non-existent time or an ambiguous time because of the daylight savings time, 
then an exception will get thrown. It'll say, no, you can't do that. But that's why I chose something like 9 a.m. If I'd chosen 2.30 a.m. for this example, then it wouldn't have run, and uh, right here in the middle, an exception would have, would have been thrown. But normally, you don't choose things in such times. That's why we have daylight savings time in the middle of the morning like that, the middle of the very early morning. Uh, so I got a little bit ahead of myself. This next slide just explains what I just said. If you choose something ambiguous or non-existent, you get an exception thrown. Uh, otherwise, it just intuitively does the right thing. It adds a day. Now, if you want to do this in UTC time instead, it's just as easy. Let's change the experiment to do that. Now, instead of getting local time here, I'm getting sys time. I still add one day, just like I did before. Now my local time changes, and my UTC time stays constant. So you have both options available to you. Both are valid computations. This one can never throw an exception because there's always a UTC time there to, to land on. Uh, you're never going to land on a UTC time that is ambiguous or non-existent. Uh, and that's why it's really a UTC is really more than just a time zone. UTC is an international timekeeping standard. So uh, this library has a lot of power, and now I'm going to delve into something that's not even possible with other C++ time zone libraries. Let's say you've got a time, a time stamp that looks like this. We've printed out the time zone abbreviation. Let's say we want to parse this in and convert that time zone abbreviation to an actual time zone. The bad news is you can't. It's ambiguous. The reason it's ambiguous is because more than one time zone will use the, uh, the same time zone abbreviation at the same time. Um, however, this library gives you enough tools that you've got a fighting chance that you could narrow things down to a short list of time zones. And I want to just go through that. Uh, I'm going to set this up with a little bit of code. I'm going to put a timestamp in a stream, uh, parse it with local seconds. I want to get the abbreviation out. Uh, so these first four lines we've all seen before a couple of times. And now we look, we're looking at this function, uh, find by abbreviation, takes a local time point and a string with the abbreviation. Now this function does not come with this library. And there's a good reason it doesn't come with the library. One, you really don't want to be doing this. Uh, two, it's a little bit expensive. It might take several milliseconds. Um, and so it's really not something that I want to encourage people to do, but I'm showing you here because it shows the power of this library. If you get yourself in a bind, you can do pretty amazing things with this library. So I'm going to show how to implement find by abbreviation here. Uh, it's going to be templated on duration, make it a little general. And what it's going to do is iterate through all the time zones in the database and form a vector of zoned times, uh, which could possibly print out this local time with this abbreviation. Now, the thing to notice here is I kind of skipped over it rather fast. I said it's going to iterate through all time zones in the database. No other time zone library in C++, there, are, there is one in Java. No other time zone in, li, uh, in C++, no other library allows you to iterate over all the time zones. So this is very, very powerful. You can iterate over every time zone. You can inspect it. You can find its properties. Uh, and, and do anything you want with it, except modify it. You can't modify it, but you, know, you can find out everything there is to find out about that time zone. And that's pretty much what we're going to do, except we're only going to look at abbreviations here. We're going to look at all the time zones, and for each individual time zone, I'm going to ask for information at this local time, TP. The information changes for each time zone. The information changes with time, so information is a function of time. You can ask for information either with a sys time or a local time. And here I'm specifically and purposefully using local time because we parsed the local time earlier. Now, one of the pieces of information that you can get out is whether there's a unique mapping to UTC time, an ambiguous mapping, or a non-existent mapping, no mapping at all. And you get the latter two during a daylight savings time transition. For example, when you're going from standard time to daylight time, you're skipping over a whole hour, and so there's some time in there that if you specified a local time in that missing gap, there is no mapping to UTC time. Or if you're, if you're um, falling back, there might be two mappings to UTC time. 
uh, 2.30, uh, 1.30 a.m. can occur twice a night, for example. So we're going to ask for each of the... I'm sorry? They, they can have different abbreviations. I'm about to, about to get to that. Um, so for each of these mappings, I'm going to ask this question. Is the mapping uh, unique, ambiguous, or non-existent? I'm going to do something different for all three. And I couldn't quite fit this wonderfully powerful but kind of unusual function on one slide. So I'm going to scrape the bottom of the function off and the top of the function off and just zoom in on this uh, switch statement so we can see what's going on. If it's a unique mapping, then we say, OK, what's the abbreviation for this mapping? And is that abbreviation the same string that I passed in? If it is the same string, then I've got a local time and I've got a time zone. And that's all I need to make a zoned time. So I make a zoned time and I push it back onto my results vector and I move on and I go to the next time zone and see if it also matches. If it's an ambiguous time, it could have two time zone abbreviations, and either one of those might check. So I check the first, and if it matches, then I choose the earliest mapping and create a, time, uh, a zone time out of that mapping. If it matches the second abbreviation, then I choose the later time zone, the, le the, the later mapping, and choose the abbreviation out of that and create a zoned time and push that back on the result. So it's very powerful here. You can go in and do lots of things at a really low level here. If it's a non-existing mapping, there's nothing to be done. Ignore the time zone and move on to the, to the next time zone. And then you just return whatever your, your vector has. And here you, here's how you might use it. You go through a loop, and you can print out each of these time zones, and you can print out the name of each of these time zones as well. And so when I run this code for this particular timestamp, this is what I get. Now, in the IAE, uh, IANA time zone database, there's a bunch of time zones. There's like 300 of them. But here, I've narrowed our choices down to six possible time zones that this timestamp could possibly come from. So maybe you have some information for your application that's known a priori to make your choice easier. You know, you can maybe have something to narrow down from just those six to which is the correct time zone for you. So I mentioned that you can get the name of the time zone. No other C++ library allows you to map from time zone to time zone name. And this is in itself very powerful, even if you're not having to do this. Uh, let's say you're, you've got a time zone from a current zone, so you don't know the name of it. Um, and if you, let's say you want to format this thing out and then parse it back in and not have to go through the horrible um, choices that we had to do with find by abbreviation. So you can actually parse this out using names so that it's completely unambiguous what time zone you're referring to. Um, you could also parse it out with time zone offsets, but even with a time, time zone offset, you don't really know what time zone that maps to because different time zones can use the same time zone offset, the same UTC offset. So even uh, percent little z is not a way to parse this out unambiguously. Uh, but if we parse it out like this using time zone name, then we get our, our timestamp along with the time zone name, and now we have something that's completely unambiguous that we've uh, formatted out. And then we can very easily parse it back in using the rules that, that I've already told you. In we use cap Z, but now instead of cap Z standing for the time zone abbreviation, it stands for the actual time zone identifier. So we pa parse that into a string, and now we've got the time zone name and the time point, and we can make a zoned time out of that. And now we've made a complete serialization, deserialization round trip with zero loss of information. All right, uh, next, computing with leap seconds. It's a de facto standard that every system clock uh, implemented, there's three of them right now, uh, traffic in what's called Unix time, which is counting time since 1970, neglecting the existence of leap seconds. Now, this, that's not specified in the standard. It just happens to be what it is today. Uh, yesterday, uh, Stefan actually told me that Visual Studio number next is going to change their epic from 1970 to uh, 1601 for, uh, for reasons unknown. Uh, that, 
That will break this library, but not very badly. I'll very easily be able to if def around that and, and keep this working. So if you happen to know that fact because you work for Microsoft over there, don't worry. It's not a problem for this library. Um, but if you, uh, if you take two sys times and you subtract them across a leap second insertion point, you, you basically get the wrong answer by one second. And for most of the time, that really doesn't matter. But if it does matter to you, this library can help you out. And the reason that this library can help you out is that at the beginning of the talk, I said this library presents to you every single bit of data in this IA in a time zone database. And some of the data that's in there is all of the leap second insertion dates. So this library presents that information to you. And the way it does is it creates a new chrono clock called UTC clock and chrono time points that are associated with that clock named UTC time. And it introduces conversion functions, bidirectional conversion functions between UTC time and sys time. So now it's very, easily to, very easy to create sys times in the same way that we've been showing before. And here I'm creating one right uh, just prior to the insertion of the last leap second, which was at uh, the last leap second came in at uh, midnight July 1st of 2015. And this is a time point 400 milliseconds before that insertion. And I want to uh, then convert that to a UTC time. So I use my two UTC time conversion function. And I'm going to iterate from there to two seconds later. And I'm going to do something every 200 milliseconds over here. And what I'm going to do is for each iteration, I'm going to take my UTC time, convert it back to sys time, and then print both out so we can see what's going on. How, how do they compare to each other as we go through a leap second insertion? Uh, this library is actually a wonderful way to explore such questions. Uh, you can teach yourself, you know, if you're not sure how, how all this works, how it actually works. So this is exactly what gets printed out, uh, except I took some artistic liberties with the uh, font color. Uh, it won't print out gray for you automatically. Uh, the gray is the uh, time before the leap second insertion the, uh, and after the leap second insertion, and, and the black is during the leap second insertion. And the first thing to notice is that before the leap second and after the leap second, UTC time and sys time print out the exact same thing. Earlier I said that sys time was a very close approximation to UTC time, and this is exactly what I was referring to. Sys time is exactly UTC time, except during a leap second insertion. So during a leap second insertion, UTC time rolls up to 60 seconds per minute, the, the 60th second per minute, uh, whereas uh, sys time just kind of locks itself and holds at the very last instant before the leap second insertion. And by last instant, I mean to whatever precision that particular uh, sys time can handle. So it just locks up at the last instant and holds. And then after the leap second insertion is over, then again, it's uh, right in sync with UTC time. So this has a implication when you're uh, subtracting uh, time points across a leap second insertion. Here I again, I go to this last leap second insertion, pick something just before it, just after it, I subtract them. Oh, and I'm gonna sneak this in. There's a, another header with this library called Chrono IO that I'm implicitly using here that allows you to take any duration at all, such as the one created by this subtraction of two time points and print it out without using dot count. Uh, and it'll print out the correct number of units. So it's a little minor pain in the butt that is now gone. Uh, so at, at any rate, two sys times, one before uh, the leap second, one after. We subtract them, we get 400 milliseconds, which is technically the wrong answer. And technically, most people don't care. Uh, but if you do care, this library allows you to handle it. Convert both of these to UTC time and subtract them. And now we get the correct answer, 1400 milliseconds. That leap second is now included in the computation. Now, just to give a sanity check here. I'm going to take this same experiment, roll it forward by exactly one year, but one year later, we did not insert a leap second at this time. Uh, so now, both cases print out the correct answer of 400 milliseconds. So this stuff really is tracking leap second insertion exactly as specified by the IANA database. Um, 
If, if they say it happened, then it happened, and this library responds to it. Uh, there also exist uh, four other clocks, I'm sorry, two other clocks, uh, TAI clock and GPS clock. TAI and GPS are other international timekeeping standards. Uh, they're both leap second aware, and there exist uh, bidirectional conversion functions among all four of these time points of the form two, you know, whatever time. So two sys time or two UTC time. The, the syntax is as uniform as I could make it. Uh, so for example, if we did our uh, same experiment as we did before, but now instead of converting to sys time, convert to TAI time, uh, this is what it looks like. And the interesting thing to notice here is that before the leap second insertion, TAI is exactly 35 seconds ahead of UTC, and then we go through the leap second insertion, and now TAI is 36 seconds ahead of UTC. Now, TA, TAI never rolls up to 60 seconds per minute or 61 seconds per minute. It always has just 60 seconds per minute. So every time we insert a leap second, UTC and TAI d diverge by another second. Uh, so in summary, um, a uh, time zone library has been presented, which is an extension of Chrono. It's type safe, it's fully functional, and it presents all the data in the IA in a time zone database. It's even leap second aware if you need that, but you have to convert to one of these leap second aware clocks to, to do that computation if you want. And it's um, available at this GitHub library, uh, GitHub address. Uh, MIT open source license. Um, there's uh, issues list going on if you have bugs to report. There's a uh, Gitter, uh, Gitter room for chatting about it. Uh, active community, other people are contributing towards it, uh, to it. Uh, so if you're interested, I encourage you to take a look. And if you have problems with it, please email me or find me after the meeting and, and complain. Uh, I can help get you, uh, get you set up and running. And uh, I believe we still have time for questions, if I'm correct. So, Marshall, you had the first one, I guess. Do you remember what it was? Yeah, you got to go back there. I, I was just, I actually, I wanted to point out something that, that might not have been obvious to everybody, but when you were doing the, um, yeah, I got to go back almost again. All right, let me see. First doing the string conversion, probably like slide nine. Oh, that's not right. <laughs> that's nice. That's less right. Yeah, I think I probably just messed this up, so I need to get my mouse over there. And then up here, push this button, might work. Okay, at least we're back to there. Now I'll go back to the beginning using the only way I know how. Uh, do you remember what was on the slide? Okay. Nope. Uh, let me put this over here a second. There you go. All righty. Back one. Back one. Yeah, I just wanted to comment that if, that if you had said February 20th, it, it of course would have turned out PST. Correct. Because in Los Angeles on the 20th of February, that's correct. The, the time zone abbreviation is a function of the time and the time zone. Uh, yes? Uh, how do you handle past time time? Because you, know, you have to change days which you know, maybe not uh, right in 2016 or Right. So the question is how do we handle uh, times before the current time zone rules? And the answer is that's all handled in the IA in a time zone database. It has all of that information in there, and this is a compiler of that database, if you will, a complete parser. And so you handle it just by using the library. It just works. Uh, the other side of that question, how far forward does that go? Uh, it goes infinitely far into the future or as far as you want to believe it, uh, whichever is shorter. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. What's the cost of converting time zones? Um, 
the, the first time it goes through, it has to initialize the database, and that can take uh, a few milliseconds, but after that, it's more like a few microseconds. Uh, yes, Yarner. Uh, that I you are correct, and that would be a great addition. The only thing I, that I currently have on that was uh, this thing up here, which is really not part of the library, but an example of the sort of things that can happen. Right. If I give this present, the, the answer is, could I, uh, do I have examples of where things go wrong and what it looks like? And I don't really, uh, but that's an excellent suggestion. If I give this presentation again, I will be sure to include that. Thank you. Uh, in the back there. Sure. Uh, let's see. That was, this, this is it. This is one, the one in UTC. Okay, the, the question is, in this example, how is the time zone preserved in this computation right here? And a uh, very good question, thank you. So meeting is of type uh, zoned time, which is a pairing of a time zone and a, a local time, or you can think of it as a pairing of a, local, a time zone and a sys time. So when in this line, I get from that zoned time the sys time, do the computation, and the result of this computation, as you correctly stated, ha well, it has UTC associated with it, so maybe we should talk about the uh, the previous example, um, this local time, this result has no time zone associated with it. However, the zoned time is still there. It still has a time zone and a local time. And this assignment just reassigns that local time and it keeps its existing time zone. It, that's correct. It's really like a setter. Uh, so it's, this is a setter for the local time and on the other slide, it's a setter for the UTC time, uh, whether or not those are directly stored. The local time, as an implementation detail, the local time isn't actually stored. It's computed every time it's needed. And it's actually a pairing of a time zone and a sys time. Uh, yes? Uh, the database is load, loaded at first use, and um, it Depending on how you install the software, it depends on how you get it. Uh, by default on uh, Mac and Linux, it will automatically download from the IAA, IANA database for you, the, their website. On Windows, that's not set up for you automatically, mainly because Windows doesn't come with uh, live curl nor um, uh, gzip. But if you install those, then uh, Windows can also be set up to automatically download the beta database. Now you can install this library in another way so that you don't have the automatic download. And then you go to the database, the, the website manually, the IANA website, download the file, decompress it, and configure this library to point to wherever you decompressed it. And it will grab it from there, initializing it on each application run first use. Yes. The, the, the database is a singleton in the application. And it has thread safe initialization. Yes? How far back do the time does this go? The database goes back as early as I think, I'm going to guess 1835 is the earliest entry in the database. The library will go back to the year negative 32,000 and whatever. It's the year store, stored in a 16-bit in a uh, short. Signed short. Uh, yes. Um, 
Uh, those work on uh, time points from the Chrono Library, and the calendars also have less than uh, operators on them as well. Yeah, on, on zoned times, there are no less than operators uh, for that very reason. But there are equality operators. Uh, question back here. Yes. Really, the Julian calendar. Uh, is there um, support for Gregorian calendars? Uh, the default is uh, Gregorian calendar. <clears throat> and it, yeah, it's a proleptic Gregorian calendar that just goes back forever using the Gregorian rules. And that way you can, uh, the reason that was done is because different countries switched between the two calendars at different times and I didn't want to deal with that mess. So you can switch between any two calendars you want, any time you want, even whether it's between Julian and Gregorian or between Julian and Islamic or... Uh, this is true, and and of course it would also depend on the locale you're you're speaking about. It's a mess, or it it, it was it was a much bigger mess than it is today. Yes. Uh, actually, I believe it is. Yes, they, in fact, that's a very recent addition. Uh, they just started signing it a few months ago. The database, by the way, gets updated like six or seven or eight times a year. Uh, so the, the time zone rules are actually changing globally, practically monthly. Yeah. Uh, so, in fact, they're just about to uh, download a new database that is probably going to break this library, but I know how to fix it. I'll have it fixed within an hour after they publish a new, a new database. So it doesn't break on every new database. Uh, yes. Um, Boost date time doesn't have a uh, full history. They only have the latest rules. Uh, boost date time doesn't have all these, uh, the different times for local time and UTC time. Uh, there's no leap second awareness uh, at all that I'm aware of in the boost date time library. Uh, the integration with the Chrono library is not nearly as good because it was invented long before Chrono. Um, but uh, I, would, I don't know for sure, but I would guess that the parsing and formatting of Boost Library is just as good and maybe even better than this. If you find a place where it's better, let me know and I'll try to you know, see if we can fix that up. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, is there a way to, uh, to do what CCTZ does and make sure that in fact conversion, a conversion is never a throw? Uh, they just give you, even if the time does not exist, they just give you some reason Yes. So in one of my examples, I don't remember exactly where, I used uh, choose earliest and choose latest. I believe it was during the uh, time zone uh, abbreviation mapping example. There's a way to, so you can use that enumeration in several of the APIs to say, if I do something stupid here, don't throw, uh, give me the earliest or give me the latest. And uh, that's, uh, you can, that's very intuitive when it's an ambiguous time zone. Uh, when it's a, uh, I'm sorry, an ambiguous mapping. When it's a non-existent mapping, both of those map to the UTC time that are on either side of the gap. So it would be what uh, CCTZ calls, um, help me out here, Greg. Um, I can't remember. <laughs> UTC has a, a name for that, and it's, I'm, I'm blanking on what they call it, but that is what both earliest and latest give you. I, I believe that this library has much more functionality than, than CCTZ. Uh, yes, Beeman. Any plans for standard, uh, uh, the proposal has been written with most of this library in it. Um, it was uh, proposed in the last meeting in Ulu. I was not able to attend that meeting and the committee was extremely busy with getting the, uh, the CD out. So it, it has not been reviewed. I'll be updating uh, the proposal uh, and submitting it again for uh, Issaquah the next meeting this fall. 
I do plan on being in Issaquah. Yes? <laughs> that was Egypt, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Those crazy Egyptians. So, you know, IANA doesn't ship databases quickly enough to accommodate that. You've got to have some way to inject into the application, hey, I have some rule of rights. So, they just have to have these in place. I'm sorry, I haven't been repeating the questions, and so I'll start now while it's too late. <laughs> um, the, the, the question was, is there any way to inject more information in, or override the information in your database. And actually, there, there is a way to do that now. It's not terribly user-friendly, but this library operates off the text version of that database. And so you can just go in and edit that database the same way um, you know, they would do at IANA and set it, edit it to say whatever you want, even if it's not right. Uh, yes? Uh, once it's been initialized, the database takes, um, I believe it's 800K, somewhere in there. Uh, you know, it's, if you're talking 1983 computers, it's your entire memory, but today, you know, it's, you know, it's half a Beatles song. Yes? Uh, there, is a, there is a way to get, uh, if you've got a, a, a time and you find your offset, there's a way to find out how long that offset is valid for both in the past and in the future. Uh, and there's also other meta, metadata you can get, is you can get the version of your uh, local database and compare that to the version of the IAA, IANA version to find out if you're out of date or not. Yes, Marshall. All right. Can I, can I walk the history of that database, of that time zone, back to when it was created, when it first, first showed up to me, whatever that was? Right. In, like, 1880 or whatever that was. So, that, so the answer is yes, but the way you do it is you, you go in, you pick a starting point, and you find out how long your abbreviation is valid into the past, and then you jump to that point and repeat. Okay. And, and so it's actually a pretty fast operation. Uh, yeah. So you can iterate backwards or forwards by finding out when that uh, UTC offset uh, stopped and started. And eventually you get to a point where there's no time zone there. Right. Or th I, th I think the way that happens is the, uh, it goes back to uh, year min, you know, negative 32,000 or what have you. Beeman. Actually, that, that can be done. Uh, I, uh, I documented that at first, and nobody seemed to be using it. And I think I may have removed that documentation, but I haven't removed the functionality. Oh, you could, uh, well, yeah. If you, you could modify the database, but that would be laborious to do. Uh, but actually, in the parsing of the database, there's a, there's a way to window either it, window it by geography or by temporally. You can window it in, in both ways if you wanted to not load the, the entire database. Yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much for coming.